So a year and a half ago, we started our study of 1 Corinthians, and we moved from 1 Corinthians right on into 2 Corinthians. And as we've walked through these two letters, kind of in one sense four letters, but we've only actually studied two of them because God only saw fit to preserve for us two of them, uh, we have seen a lot of things, right? Um, we've considered these different visits that Paul has made to this church. We've seen uh, just some amazing gospel truths that, that are, that's always there in Paul's writing. We've learned foundational theology. We saw this really clearly in 1 Corinthians. Of course, continues on into 2 Corinthians that even in his correction, what Paul does is he comes in and he brings in this foundational theology that we have erred in or that has been erred in and lays that down as the foundation. This is a church as we've kind of walked through and looked at and considered different things about this church. It's a church that has struggled with worldliness and struggled with sin, struggled with doctrinal error. And it would appear that it has been more than in just one or two minor areas and more than just one or two incidents. Uh, it seemed as though they needed a lot of correction. And I was thinking this week, I wonder if uh, the Corinthians, when we all get to heaven, will be... Uh, I don't know if famous is the right word, but do you think it'll be like, okay, so tell me what really happened, right? What were you thinking when you, you know, I don't know, some of those things that maybe we shouldn't be doing that once we get to heaven, but it's just, it's interesting, right? Because we know that this is a church of, of believers, and so we'll be there with them uh, at some point. So, but I think it's, it's easy to say that, that the people of this church didn't always make it easy for Paul to love them. Uh, but love them he did, right? And uh, rebuke is necessary at times. Uh, when you love someone, you do have to do that. Uh, you have to really appreciate, too, the power behind Paul's rebuke, but also the gentleness of the correction and the deep love that is clearly apparent as he does that. So today, as we look at this, uh, this final chapter in these two letters, we'll finish our study of these two very powerful letters, and we will see once again Paul's pastoral love and care for his people. His final exhortation will include a gospel emphasis and reminders about repentance, self-examination, unity, and holiness so that we can be faithful and consistent in our own pursuit of sanctification, both individually and corporately as a body of believers. We've got 14 verses that we're going to get through today. There's six points. Really, it's just to try to be consistent with our theme our overall theme as a church, it's five points and a bonus. So we'll look at it that way. So just realize that. Number six is really the bonus point. Um, so I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 13. And we're just going to jump right into this. The title of the message today is The Lens of Sanctification. Because as you know, as I've told you many times, the goal of the Christian life is sanctification. And so as this letter concludes, Paul's going to lay down several principles that that must be in place in our lives as we strive towards sanctification. Uh, so I invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We're reading verses 1 through 14. This is the Word of the Lord. This is the third time I am coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter shall be confirmed. I have previously said when present the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Since you're seeking proof that Christ speaks in me, he is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For indeed, he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the power of God. For we also are weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God toward you. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test. But I hope that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong. Not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that you be restored. For this reason I am writing these things while absent, 
so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers, rejoice, be restored, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these two letters and just the, the wonderful reminders of who you are and what you have done all along the way. We thank you for, for, for the, the framework that you have given us for this foundation of how we should pursue the Christian life. And so as we consider these final words of Paul uh, to this church, we pray that you would work in our lives, that you would work in our hearts, that you would instruct us not only in your word, but instruct us from your word in how we are to live our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So um, as we look at this and as we kind of consider these points, uh, just a reminder, check the blog tomorrow for a list of these things. If you have notes and you're taking notes, great. But I'll also put just sort of a condensed summary of this on, on the blog tomorrow that you should be able to access quickly because these are important elements of things that we need to stay focused on as we look at life and view life through the lens of the pursuit of sanctification. The first thing that has to be in place if we are to live lives pursuing sanctification is repentance. That's the first one. That's, we see that in these first three verses here in 2 Corinthians. There's a reminder of the necessity of repentance and connected with that, at times, possibly, church discipline. Remember, Paul concluded the end of verse tw the chapter 12 with a powerful call to repentance. And he, he, you know, coming out of that, he called on them to repent of strife and jealousy and outbursts of anger and selfish ambition and slander and gossip and arrogance and, and any form of sexual sin. He, you know, again, we're told to not even let there be a hint of that. And again, I've said it before, I'll say it multiple times probably throughout this message. You might even hear it every week. The goal of the Christian life is sanctification. And the truth is we must be constantly in a full-on pursuit of holiness in all of our conduct, in all of our attitudes, and in all of our actions. And that begins with repentance, which again is not a one-time thing. Repentance is not just I repented, I got saved, and now I'm moving on with the rest of my life. Repentance is an ongoing mindset that begins in salvation but continues throughout life. And one thing that hopefully has become obvious to us as we've gone through this and, uh, is, is that uh, we see the lack of that in so many different ways in our world, right? It, as you look around our world today, it's kind of painfully obvious that uh, not everyone is in a pursuit of holiness. Even many churches, many Christians uh, have, have compromised in so many different ways when we start to think about these things. And, and one of the fundamental reasons that so many have strayed from this, from the truth and from what we would call sound doctrine and right thinking, is because of a lack of commitment to holiness. You see, if the pursuit of sanctification is not on your radar, not your main agenda, the result of a lack of commitment to holiness will be an insensitivity to sin and a shallow commitment to Scripture. That's what so many people struggle with. And if you don't actually believe in the inerrancy, the authority, the sufficiency, and the inspiration of Scripture, your understanding of sin will be very diminished and that will affect your pursuit of sanctification. Because wherever sin is tolerated, it undermines the gospel. And ultimately, that's what this entire letter, both of these letters are completely about sanctification. This was Paul's deepest passion. It was his deepest desire. It was his deepest hope for the Corinthian church. That's my deepest desire for us here at Coram Deo is to pursue sanctification. Paul was desperate for, for this body of believers to reject the lies of the false teachers that had, that had drawn them and, and pulled them away. And he wants them to turn their hearts back to the st straight and narrow pursuit of holiness. This entire chapter, this last chapter, this conclusion is all about the pursuit of holiness and sanctification. And repentance is the starting point of that. That's why he had so much of an emphasis on that leading into it. That's the framework and the setup for today. And we even see that in the very beginning of this chapter. Without repentance, 
the intensity that he's going to bring toward those who are, are not in repentance is going to be really turned all the way up. And excommunication is in view here. He doesn't say it right out, but it's right there. This passage isn't inherently about church discipline as a whole, but we see that that is one of the principles that is in play here. Because over and over, the Bible calls us to holiness. It's not just here. It's not just in the, the, the well-known 1 Peter 1.15, right? Be holy because I am holy. Be holy in all your conduct. In Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all over the Bible, we're called to holiness. It's not an optional extra. It's not some higher level pursuit that you start on once you reach a certain level of spiritual maturity. After you've done these lower level exercises, now I can pursue holiness. That's not the the idea. That's not what it's about. God intends that we pursue holiness all the time. And He will bring discipline toward us to keep us focused on it. In Job chapter 5, listen to this. Behold, how blessed is the man whom God reproves. So do not reject the discipline of the Almighty. Hebrews 12 tells us, Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when, not if, but when you are reproved by Him. For the Lord disciplines those whom He loves. All the way to the very end in Revelation. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. So God's discipline is consistently taught throughout the Scripture from the earliest writings all the way to the end, and it's connected to repentance. Now, formal church discipline certainly is being spoken of here, right? You know, Matthew 18 gives us that framework. You go to the person. If you see someone in sin, you, you go tell them. If, if, they still, if they reject it, you go back with someone else. If they still reject it, you ultimately tell it to the church, and as a final step, you would put them out of the church. Paul has been so gracious with this church so far, even after the the bad visit that happened. He did put somebody out of the church back in 1 Corinthians 5. And and really the warning here in these opening verses of chapter 13, the warning is, I've given you plenty of warning. When discipline is, actually though, when discipline is happening rightly, and you can't miss the root of the word discipline, is disciple. So discipline and discipleship are very much connected And we should constantly, even as a part of our discipleship and as our helping one another follow Jesus better, we should be constantly uh, disciplining one another. We should be constantly correcting. And and there's a sense in which the ebb and flow of the life of a healthy church has church discipline happening all the time. And it would be happening, but it would be almost invisible to everybody else. You see somebody doing something like, hey, I think you might should consider that. Oh, cool. Thank you for pointing that out. You're right. I'll, I'll change that. It, bring it to their attention. That, that should just be part of the ebb and flow of our helping one another follow Jesus better and in our pursuit of sanctification. We should want to you know, sand off those rough, jagged edges. And, and when it's done right, when it's done in love, relationships are strengthened because of it. You know, It should be sort of one and done. That's the goal. You're sinning, someone points it out, thank you, repent, and we move on. You know, do you realize that? Oh, no, I didn't realize that. Now, there does come a point, and that's what Paul is talking about here, when the gloves come off and you kind of have to deal with it more decisively and more intensely. That doesn't, of course, mean we're on a witch hunt. This is not the Spanish Inquisition where you are just searching out for just looking for something like, if I watch you close enough and wait long enough, you'll, you'll trip up and I'll be there to spring the trap. That's not what we're talking about, right? But the truth is someone living in unrepentant sin it will eventually become obvious to everyone in some way. And there does come a point at which someone needs to be removed from the church. Titus 3 says, Avoid foolish controversies about genealogies and strife and conflicts about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. And then he goes on with this very clear and I think important uh, thought. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing, this is why, such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So ultimately, you're condemning yourself when you continue in sin, even with warnings. The ESV actually puts it, I think, really well. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. The Amplified goes on to say, ban him from your fellowship. That's how serious church unity is. Someone who creates factions, us versus them, 
someone who stirs up division, while there is grace in giving them warnings, a plea to repent, we, we have to remember that unity and, and purity and doctrine are very important, right? They're so important that if you're continually disrupting them, if you're continually bringing disunity in that is impure, that is something that's in accord with false doctrine, you need to repent or you need to be removed. That's, that's the admonition here. And, and in fact, our testimony as believers to the world requires holiness, which is what this is about. It's not about catching people in their sin. It's not about, oh, I get to call you out now. It's about we need to be holy and, and we need to do all that we can because our testimony to the world requires that. So we always need to be striving for sanctification. We always need to be open for correction because for 99% of us, maybe more, there is something we need to be corrected about. Probably today, if you really are being very honest. So we need to live lives that are characterized by repentance. We need to be radically passionate about personal holiness, about the purity of the body. And we need to chase after the unity that comes as a result when we're all on the same page. It's, that's, that, then we see this phrase, so that's, that's what he's talking about here. It's like, it really is this serious. And then he comes in kind of behind that and he says, you're seeking proof that Christ speaks in me. So we can't, we can't forget that the fundamental sin going on here and what Paul is pushing back against is the rebellion against authority that's going on in the Corinthian church. And, and you know, if we're, let's, if we're really honest about this, rebelling against authority is sort of built into our flesh. Right? Everybody wants to do what they want to do. Everyone wants their own way. And, and tragically, our culture has done really a bang-up job of teaching us that that's exactly how it should be. You really should get what you want. If you remember the Burger King ad, some of the people that are older, remember the Burger King ad from years ago, have it your way at Burger King. You come here, you'll, we'll make the hamburger exactly how you want it. Now, that's not inherently a, a bad thing when it comes to a hamburger. But that mindset, that idea, today we're, 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 we're thrown out this idea of custom made, right? Get online and get the custom made things. You can get custom made t-shirts. There was a, I remember seeing one time, you could get custom made Levi jeans, like, you know, you, all that. You know, I, I had a friend one time, and I, this was when I rode my bike all the time, was telling me about a particular brand of bicycle, how they bring you in and they measure everything, like from your fingers to your elbow, from your elbow to your shoulder, from your shoulder to your... So that the bike is made very precisely to the exact dimensions of your body. We're obsessed with this custom-made, bespoke, right? The bespoke this, the idea that it's been custom-tailored to my specific needs and desires. And do you realize that there's an entire TV network devoted to the idea of you get it the way you want it? It's called HGTV, right? You know, almost every single show is about uh, somebody getting the perfect home, their forever home, and reinforcing this idea that, that you should get it the way, exactly the way you want it. The show, love it or list it, right? We spend all this money making the house exactly what I want, but if I find something that's more to my desires, we're going to leave it and we're going to go over here. That's that mindset that we all have, that everything should be custom tailored to my desires, and because I have this built-in want for that, and ultimately this really becomes down to a matter of authority. This was an assault on Paul's authority as an apostle and his authority in this church. They were pushing back against that. Ignore him. Hey, don't listen to that. Listen to what you want, what you love, what you feel, right? And what you have to remember is that a preacher's authority, when, when Paul preached the word, and that's in view here, right? When Paul preached the word, it's the word that is proclaimed. There's a point. There's a purpose. The authority isn't in the preacher. The authority is in the word as it is preached. The main task of a pastor, of any preacher, is found in Ephesians 4. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And the full knowledge of the Son of God, that's sanctification. To a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That's the goal. That's holiness. That's sanctification. That's purity. And why do we need that? So that we're no longer children tossed here and there by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, 
by craftiness and deceitful scheming. That, that's what the false teachers here had been doing. They had, they had led the people to question Paul's authority. They pointed out his humility and his gentleness and his meekness. It's really weakness, they said. It's okay to look for proof of apostolic authority, just like it's right to look for the qualification of men that aspire to be elders. But be sure you're using the right standards. You know, sometimes the things that seem to be impressive that would have been impressive with these false teachers, whether it be a forceful personality or a, an amazing intellect, powerful oratory, somebody that has a really winsome personality or, or worldly dis- success, all of those key things can be very distracting to us. We can easily become enamored with and drawn to the wrong things. But remember, Paul had worked out the signs of a true apostle among them with perseverance. So when we're evaluating these things, let me just tell you this. Listen clear, carefully. God's word isn't the gold standard. God's word is the standard. Okay? It's not that we have the, the bronze, the silver, the other standards, and God's word is the ultimate, the highest. No, God's word is the standard, period. Other things don't even, don't even compare. So don't think, oh, this is the gold standard. No, this is the only standard. There's nothing else to compare it to, right? We, we, we're, and the truth is we're all drawn to things based on the, uh, our particular affinities, sometimes more than we are the biblical standards, right? A, a powerful, charismatic, attractive personality can, can really pull us in, but we need to go with the standards that God has given us. And by human standards, Paul did appear weak. In fact, he gave them all the evidence they needed to prove that according to human standards, he was weak. He laid out their case for them, not only here, other letters, right? The many afflictions, the the sorrowful visit, uh, his apparent depression at times. He talked about his own weakness. He said, I'm with you in weakness and fear and trembling. He called himself earlier a clay pot. And, And you know what they used clay pots for in this culture? Same thing we go across the hall for. So so when it comes to true strength, you have to look through the right lens, not the lens of what seems attractive to us, but the lens of the only standard. That's where we start. And that leads us immediately to uh, Paul's gospel focus, which comes up in verse 4 of this passage as we're working through it. It says, For indeed he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the power of God. And I've said this so many times, but... I love how Paul so consistently brings the gospel to bear. It comes to the surface again and again, and it just jumps off the page at us. It's even more evidence of Paul's authority that he has has this unwavering, bold commitment to proclaim the gospel. And he's doing that right in the middle of this again. The power of God is on display in the gospel. The power of God comes forth when the gospel is proclaimed. Paul was probably, outside of Jesus, the most authoritative proclaimer of the gospel ever to live. And I love it when it jumps off the page like this. He was crucified, yet he lives. That that is the central truth of the gospel. And it reminds us of everything that leads into it, right? Whenever we hear he was crucified, well, we need, why was he crucified? Well, Yahweh made the heavens. And we are to ascribe to Yahweh the glory of his name. And whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God. Of course, the problem is, is that we haven't done that. We wouldn't do that on our own. We don't even want to do that on our own. Because there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. All, and all means all, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. I mean, to turn to God, to trust in Him, to to, to follow the Savior would be a good thing. But there is none who does good. That's the backdrop, right? That's the absolute bottom line reality that we all face. And because of the universal situation we all find ourselves in, he was crucified, becomes the most glorious thing ever. Literally nothing surpasses the awesomeness that we find in this verse, that he was crucified, yet he lives. Romans 5 comes in and tells us, God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were sinners, which we all were, Christ died for us. Christ suffered for for sins, the the righteous for the unrighteous. He was crucified that he might bring you to God. 
And he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we, you, might become the righteousness of God. And if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Because with the heart we believe, which leads to righteousness, and with the mouth we confess, which leads to salvation. So the call is simply this, repent and believe in the gospel. That's the starting point. And the gospel just is just rich in this verse. I love these, these where the, it just keeps coming back and forth, back and back and back and back again and again and again. He was crucified because of weakness. Yet he lives because of the power of God. For we are also weak in him. Yet we will live with him because the power of God toward you. And this is so interesting. The weakness of Jesus really wasn't weakness as we necessarily think about it. Philippians 2 clarifies it. It says, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on, his, on a cross. It was his human nature that was weak. It, he wasn't born into a royal family. He wasn't raised to be some earthly ruler. He was a humble carpenter. He, he really owned nothing more than the clothes on his back. So he was Jesus in his humanity. In that weakness, he was susceptible to death as a human. And it was in that weakness that the power of God exploded through when he raised him from the dead. That's the triumphant message of the gospel. That is the joyous, overwhelming, awesome news that we gather to celebrate every Lord's Day. He lives because of the power of God. That is just cool. Right? The crucifixion and the resurrection are the apex of history and the most glorious thing ever. The humility of Christ and the power of God working together in perfect synchronization, in perfect harmony in the gospel. And, and, and Paul himself was even an example of this, this juxtaposition of weakness and strength. And that same kind of contrast has to exist in all of us, right? We have to humble ourselves, confess our sinfulness, confess our inability to do anything to contribute to our salvation. We don't even get the ball rolling. That, that's how humble, that's how weak we are. We're, we're, we're so weak we have zero strength. I heard, I've, heard it, I've heard the gospel explained this way and it makes me cringe um, you know, at, at times. And it's like, do I correct this? Do I not? Depends on the situation, obviously. But I've heard it said the gospel is like an elevator. All you have to do is walk over, step in, and maybe push the button, and then the elevator takes over and lifts you up and saves you and all that. I've heard that said. Or I've heard it said, well, the gospel is like an escalator. You just have to step on that first step, and then, it takes, then, then Jesus takes over and, and does all the rest of the work. Let me tell you, both of those are false. Both of those are lies, because you're not able to put your foot on the bottom step you are not, much less being able to walk across, get into the elevator and push the button. Your weakness is that you're dead all the way on the other side. And even if you could get up and walk, you would not walk toward the escalator or the elevator. You'd walk the other direction. That's why Jesus did it all. Literally everything that needed to be done, Jesus did. So this weakness and strength exists in the gospel. The weakness of Jesus becoming a human so that the power of God could come in and take over that. We see the same thing in Paul. His weakness, God's strength comes through it. We have to allow our weakness to be there. Because when we're weak in Him, His power, His strength comes through. Even Acts 17 God is now commanding men that everyone everywhere should repent because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. See, there is a day coming, and it's already written on the calendar. It's on God's calendar. We don't get to peek at it, just so you know. But there is a day written down on a calendar when you will be held to account for your sins. And if you do not repent of your sins before that, today, hopefully, then the righteous judgment of God toward you will be wrath and fury. And, and this is a parallel here, but it's, it's subtle. For those that don't repent of this sin of rejecting Paul and his authority, they're, they're, they're proving that, that they're not repentant. And Paul is going to bring some power against them. So there's these same parallels going on. The warning is clear that he's issuing to these people at this church. 
If you persist in the sinful rebellion that you have been in the midst of, the divine power of Christ, which resides in Paul because of his weakness, will deal definitively with you and you will be put out of the church, which is the same thing that God will do in judgment to those who have not repented and trusted in Him. At the end of the day, sinful rebellion will be dealt with. <laughs> the end result is not good. So whether you're unsaved or, or you're just pursuing some rebellion, you need to repent and follow Jesus. Repentance isn't optional. It's not a one-time event, which is the catalyst. And this is the next point as we're walking through this, the catalyst for self-examination. That's why in verse 5, he comes in and says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Notice it's there twice, and it's there twice, I think, for a reason. We have to be certain that we're authentic Christians. That's the first thing. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Be certain you're not in rebellion against Christ in the comprehensive sense. And then he goes on to say, examine yourself. Well, that's, I guess, maybe the, the best way to put it is the lesser sense of being in rebellion against maybe a particular situation or a circumstance that God has placed you in. We, we cannot forget that salvation is more than mere agreement, that certain historical facts are true. It's more than that. Humble self-examination is always appropriate. It's always helpful. It's always necessary. So here's the deal as we look at this and think through what Paul is calling us to. Well, the first test yourself is, am I saved? The examine yourself, I think, is, am I pursuing sanctification? Those both are there. But Paul is writing to a, a group of Christians, right? He's repeatedly called them brothers. So he does. it's not like he's thinking most of these people are not saved. Some of them certainly are not saved. Some of, most of them probably are. Of course, we're told in Scripture that every church will have unsaved members and not just talking about the children who haven't been saved yet. There will be adults and, and others and people. There will always be people in the church who think they're saved but in truth are not. And in order to genuinely pursue sanctification, you have to be a genuine believer. You have to be in Christ to grow in Christ. That's why you test yourselves. That's why you examine yourselves. And let me just tell you, if you're wrong about this first test, that's a mistake that has eternal consequences. Don't be, ever be so arrogant as to say, well, I don't need to examine myself. I don't need to test myself. God's Word says otherwise. I know many people, several of them here in this room today, who've lived for many years, even as adults, thinking they were saved when in fact they were not. This is not a casual, flippant thing here in verse 5. It's not just like, test, examine, let's move on. No, it's serious business. Paul is basically, in one sense, turning this challenge around. Remember, they had challenged. Well, since you're seeking proof that Christ speaks in me, they're, they're kind of trying to push back and challenge Paul and his authority. He's saying, no, let's turn this around. You need to test yourselves. See if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. Look inward and see where you stand spiritually. And again, this idea of testing yourself, of examining yourself, of self-examination and carefully evaluating where you stand, not only in your relationship with God overall, but in your pursuit of Him, that's not a new thing. Paul didn't just come up with this here at the end of this letter. It goes all the way back to Job, which is probably the first book ever written. Job 12, how many are my iniquities and sins? And then he says this, make known to me my transgression and my sin. That goes all the way back. Self-examination is a foundational concept. And it begins with salvation and it continues in sanctification. Not only asking, am I saved? But also constantly asking, am I growing in holiness? Is there any area of your life where you are not fully surrendered to Christ? Is, is there any aspect of your life where you are continuing in disobedience? Maybe you think it's hidden over there in the corner where no one can see it, but God can see it. Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me. And instead of that, lead me in the everlasting way. We need to continually search our lives for sin, always striving to follow God in the everlasting way. And remember, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. 
So he will do that. But you are responsible to be applying all diligence toward that end as well. You can never ignore or minimize the need to self-examine. Hebrews 2 offers an even better reminder. Verse 1, pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. Reminding us we, we, we need to hear, we need to pay close attention to the Word, to the teaching of the Word, because why? We have a tendency to drift. We need constant course correction. Our attitudes, our actions, our thinking needs constant recalibration to God's Word. We, we must obey this commandment and test and examine ourselves. That repetition is so important, right? Test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Are you saved? Are you sure? How do you know? On what do you base that answer? And let me tell you what you cannot base it on. You cannot base it on, I prayed a prayer on a certain day in a certain place, and I remember I wrote it down in my Bible that I prayed the prayer on this day. Don't base it on that. Don't base it on some grand experience you had at some point. Don't base it on how you were raised. Don't base it on your heritage, religious or otherwise. I mean, I'm a third, maybe more generation Christian. My, my mom was a Christian. My grandpa was a Christian. I don't know how much farther back than that it goes on my mother's side. And that's a great blessing. Don't, I don't want to minimize the blessing it is of growing up in a Christian home, but that is not the foundation of your salvation. The foundation of your salvation is Christ and what He did on the cross. Remember the song we sing it sometimes? I don't know if we've sung it here, but we, you're probably familiar with it. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. My faith has found a resting place. From guilt, my soul is free. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. That's what you lean on. That Jesus died on the cross and that he died for you. Don't ignore the word that you hear in the gospel. Jesus is your only hope, who he is and what he has done. You cannot ignore what you hear in that because... The less you focus on it, the more you tendency you have to drift. Whether you're talking about salvation or sanctification, it's a vivid, vivid, vivid spiritual truth. Test yourself. Examine yourself. And don't harden yourself to the truths of the Bible. Hebrews 2 tells us be careful that you don't drift. Hebrews 4 warns us that there's a distinct tendency to harden our hearts because of the sin in our lives. But the Word of God... It comes and is living and active and penetrating and dividing. And, and that's what holds us accountable. So don't allow your heart to be hardened. Bring the word to bear on it. And don't sit on the fence either. Often we kind of sit on the fence. Well, I heard the truth. It's good. Hmm, maybe, maybe not. It's interesting. I agree that this is truth, but I'm just going to kind of keep moving along in this direction. You know, you can be in church your entire life. You can hear the gospel over and over and over and even believe that it's all true and still be headed to hell. You have to repent of your sins, confess Christ as Lord, and follow Him in humble obedience. That's the result of repenting and confessing. So test yourself to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Ask yourself, where am I falling short? Where have I not yet obeyed? Where am I still being disobedient? You see, the, the pursuit of sanctification requires continual self-examination and continual repentance and, and and when that is in place it will result in a deep desire for righteousness it will result in a, a just a drive to be submissive to God and and to obey his word and it will and this is where this passage goes first John 3 tells us that it that that the true believer has a love for God and a love for his people right first John 3 10 everyone who does not do righteousness is not of God as well as the one who does not love his brother and that's what we see next in this passage, beginning in verse 7. It's really not, it's, it's great here. Paul presents this, just this loving challenge to the, to the people of Corinth. He challenged them not only to test themselves and to examine themselves and to make sure they're on the right path, but he's challenging them to be in constant pursuit of obedience, and he's challenging them to live lives of integrity. Those two things are radically important and central to the pursuit of sanctification. 
Remember, so many in this congregation had just become enamored with, with these outsiders who had come in, these false apostles who had attacked Paul and somehow convinced them to look for some sort of proof that Paul really is who he says he is because he's really not. So when you look for the proof, you're not going to find it. But no, what we see here when Paul talks about praying for them, we see that the pattern of a persevering pastor is prayer for his people. We pray to God that you do no wrong. He was praying for them to return to the right path because he cared far more about their walking in the truth, about their being in the right path, than he did about appearing approved himself. That wasn't his fundamental desire that they, everybody thinks I'm cool, everybody likes me. I want you to be walking on the path. Even if, you, even if I look unapproved, even if that means, even if I look like this little idiot doofus over here, as long as you're on the right path, that's fine with me. You remember how far he took that in Romans 9? He said, all of my people are not going to heaven because they've rejected Christ. If I could go to hell and they could go to heaven, I would do that. I, 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 I don't know if I could say that about a group of people who clearly hate me at, the point, at that point. So he's talking about here, and he's, he's praying for them. And he, and he doesn't care about himself. He cares about them. And then in, in verse 8, he says, we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. He, he's saying, my life is about the truth, the entirety of God's truth. I will rejoice in that. I, I want to see it put on display in my life. I will speak of God's truth. I will teach God's truth. I will live in light of God's truth. I would never do anything against that. Ever And so when God's truth is on the line, I'm going to act decisively because I have to. I'm going to honor God over men because I have to. I will exercise any necessary discipline in defense of the truth because I have to. We know he's excommunicated people before. Don't forget about the guy back in 1 Corinthians when they expelled the immoral brother. Don't forget about Hymenaeus and Alexander who were put out of the church because of their errors. He doesn't want to do that again. But he's ready, able, and willing to do that. That's why he's praying for them, that they do no wrong, that they grow in sanctification, that they see these other teachers for who they really are, that they see what they're really doing, leading them down a different path. And again, think of me what you will. That's not my main concern. The right that he wants them to do is not only to reject the false teaching that they've just been soaking up, But what we see him writing in other places, he wants to see them walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. He wants them to see them pleasing God in all respects and bearing fruit in in all of their pursuit of good works. He wants them to see them multiplying in their knowledge of God, in the full knowledge of God. He wants to see them strengthened with God's power and steadfast and patient and being joyfully thankful to God. And he wants to see them walking in integrity. That's that be made complete. That, that you be restored, it says at the end of verse 9. That means that there's, there's repentance. There's submission to authority. They're being authentic. They're being obedient. Everything in place. That's what that restored means. That's what we mean when we talk about their integrity. That, that everything is coming back together. Although their thoughts and beliefs and words and actions are all existing together in harmony. Every area of your life submitted to God. Psalm 15 describes it well. O oh, Yahweh. Who may sojourn in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy mountain? Well, here's the answer. This is what we should strive for if we want to walk with God. He who walks blamelessly and works righteousness, speaks truth in his heart and does not, excuse me, does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a reprobate is despised. You need to despise those false teachers, not elevate them but who honors those who fear Yahweh. He swears to his own herd and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things, he who lives this way, pursuing God in this manner, will never be shaken. That's what Paul wants for his brothers and sisters here in Corinth. Have integrity and completeness in your heart. It will encompass every aspect of your life. It it will just all come together. It will become your passionate pursuit. And and then when we get to this next verse, it's the summary of the entire book in one sentence. For this reason, I am writing these things while absent, so that when present, I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up 
and not for tearing down. That's really what this whole book is about, is getting them to the point of repentance so that when he comes, they can have a good time together. So he doesn't have to deal with that sin when he comes. He's saying if you continue in your sin, if you refuse to repent, if you refuse to turn away from this false teaching and these wrong attitudes and this rebelling against authority that you've had, I'm going to come in hot Use my God-given authority to demolish the wickedness that has been so pervasive. This is serious. This is not a joke. He says, my goal, my hope is to, to build you up, to encourage you, to edify. So please repent of all this foolish sinfulness so that when I get there, we don't have to deal with that and we can just have a joyful reunion. And Paul did come. And we don't have, like, we don't have a verse anywhere that says, Paul came, they had repented, it was all good. But we can, we can surmise that from several different things. It, 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 all of the evidence that we read in, in other places surrounding this idea tells us that they did repent. That, that they did have a joyful reunion when they came. All of the evidence points to that. When Paul arrived later in, uh, in, in Corinth, he spent three months there. He actually wrote the book of Romans from there. And he didn't mention anything about any negativity there when he wrote the book of Romans. In fact, he was heading to Spain next. And if, had he had to stay in Corinth and deal with a lot of this nonsense, he probably wouldn't have been planning to go to Spain quickly, soon. He even took the offering for the Jerusalem saints back. So clearly they, they, they had returned their trust. They, they trusted him again. And, and here's the other thing to think about. If this letter hadn't been affected, if everything in it had been rejected and they continued down this path this wrong path, this different path, probably we wouldn't have 2 Corinthians in our Bible. Now, that's kind of maybe anecdotal, but, but if you think about it, um, I, I think this letter brought the reconciliation that God intended for it to achieve when God inspired Paul to write this. Isaiah 55 says this, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth, and making it bear and sprout, and giving seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So when it rains, it is effective. It does what it's supposed to do. So will my word be, which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what pleases me, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. So surely the fact that 2 Corinthians is included in the canon is evidence that the reconciliation it was intended to bring happened. And so how can you not conclude even when you read the rest of the verses? When you, when you read in verse 13, all the saints greet you. He's saying everybody else is greeting you as well. And this kind of final section here, this, this, this fifth point, is, is pointing us to unity and affection in verses 11 through 13. Two other things that we need to be intentional to pursue as, as part of our pursuit of sanctification. Notice, as Paul closes, he's, he's not worried about their financial condition. He's not worried about some worldly condition or worldly success or physical health or comfort. And he's certainly not interested in, in, in coddling their self-esteem or, or helping them to gain some level of prestige in the community. He wants to see unity and affection. Those are the last two things he points to right before he concludes it, Right? Essentially, he's saying, okay, all of that, and let me tell you, your relationships within the body, your interactions and your relationships with one another, and the affection that you have for one another is of the utmost importance. It's almost like he knows, like, it's almost like whoever inspired him to write this also inspired someone else to write that, that loving your brother is evidence of salvation in 1 John 3.10. Unity is so critical to our sanctification. Let me just tell you, if you are not persistent in full-on effort toward unity, your sanctification, your pursuit of sanctification is not what it needs to be. And the attitude that needs to pervade everything is right there. Joy in verse 11. Look, finally, brothers, rejoice. Rejoice. That's what he's saying. Rejoice. This is an essential attitude that we must have in the life of our church. 
in our worship, in our discipleship, in our family groups, as we spend time with one another, in our evangelism, joy should pervade every aspect of our church life and should be one of the main things people see if they were to just look in on us and watch what we're doing and see who we are. Joy has to be there. And then he moves immediately through this list, kind of rapid fire. Be restored, he says. He's saying be restored to one another first. Be restored to to me, to Paul. Be restored to the truth. Be restored to the right path. The Greek word there for restored means to put everything back in its proper order. Straighten up, get it together, realign yourself with Scripture, and go. And then he says be comforted. And this is an interesting, uh, interesting Greek word. It's parakaleo which is probably best, ex- best translated, be exhorted, be admonished. Uh, the J.B. Phillips translation says, consider my advice. Basically, you need to submit to authority. That's, that's what that means right there, that whole be comforted. If you're not submitting to the authorities God placed over you in your lives, you're, you're, you're not pursuing sanctification because God placed them there for your good and for His glory, all of them, in all the different contexts that you live and move in. And then then now it's getting better. Remember, all of these things are stacking on top of each other. Be like-minded. Think the same things. Have the same convictions. In his letter to the Philippians, he worded it this way. Stand firm in one spirit with one mind, contending together for the face of the gospel. And Ephesians 4 expands on that. Humility and gentleness and patience. Bearing with one another a love. Being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. And as we think about unity and this whole idea of be like-minded, there certainly is a doctrinal element to that. Romans 15 connects those two. Whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through the perseverance and encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now, may the God of perseverance and encouragement grant you... There's this kind of closing prayer to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now does that mean that we have to agree on every single little tiny jot and tittle point of doctrine down to the tiniest detail? No. But there does need to be a significant amount of alignment. I've I've talked before uh, some of you probably heard this about the, these the kind of concentric circles of doctrine of theology. There's, there is a, a, an aspect of doctrine. There, is, there are some fundamental truths that if, this, I call them the, the, center, the center circle, if you do not believe them, I cannot call you a Christian. If you deny the virgin birth, you are not a Christian. If you deny the Trinity, you are not a Christian. I could, I could go on with several other things. Now, if you deny a literal seven-day creation, six-day creation plus the rest day, I'm not going to say you're not a Christian. I'm just going to say you need to learn the Bible. <laughs> okay? So, again, there are some things that, 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 we, can, that we can have in ignorance but, but, but don't mean you're not a Christian. But there are certain things that if you deny substitutionary atonement that Jesus died in your place, You are not a Christian, right? There are some doctrines that are so fundamental. Outside of that, you're not a Christian. But then there's this second circle, which is probably where most doctrine is in, that we probably really need to agree on those, to to go to church and to do church together. If you you say that you have to speak in tongues to give evidence to your salvation, I can't go to church with you because I think that's false. I don't think it necessarily means you're not a Christian, but we're not going to get along. <laughs> You're not going to be here very long. Um, eschatology is in that third level. There are things that we can disagree on, but we can still w- walk in unity together as, as, as a body of Christ. So, and, and some of that's subjective, what goes in level two, what goes in level three, all that kind of thing. But understand that fundamentally our unity is related to, our, to, to what we believe and how we pursue that. And then there's this final thing on this list. And it's, notice it's not the result yet. It's still a command. Live in peace. Okay, so rejoice, be restored, be comforted, be like-minded, 
Live in peace. We must pursue peace. We must be diligent to maintain it and to make sure that what you're doing, that you have a desire for unity and make sure that you are actively doing everything you can to foster unity, to catalyze it, to maintain it. You should be striving at all points to generate it and protect it and keep it going, whatever it takes. And ultimately, anything that you might do that might cause disunity, don't. It's that simple. Live in peace. Consider others more important than yourselves. That's one of the keys to unity. Not striving to get your way, but doing everything you can to serve and encourage and build up others. That's how we pursue living in peace. That's how we pursue cause and maintain unity. You have to love your brothers and sisters in here in spite of them. I certainly hope you love me in spite of me. And here's the truth. The closer we get to one another, the more I know you, the more I know about you, the more I'm going to see your flaws and your faults and your little weird quirks. The more you're going to see mine, the more we get to know each other, the greater capacity we have to be annoyed or aggravated with one another. So we have to learn to bear with one another, graciously forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord graciously forgave you, so also should you. Your forgiveness of other people is based on God's forgiveness of you. And let me just put it bluntly. If God can put up with you, you can put up with him or her. And I hope me. And again, then we come to this just... The, the, the result then comes, and it just, it just jumps right out. And the God of love and peace will be with you. What an amazing result, right? When we pursue unity with all our might, when we're setting aside our personal preferences, and we're pursuing that which benefits other people more than that which I want, and you know what? Your wants might be okay. Your wants aren't inherently wrong, but it doesn't mean that you should get them all the time. You need to pursue what other people want more than what you want. That's what Paul is even doing when he says, I don't care if you really like me or not. I don't care if you consider me approved or unapproved as long as you're on the right path. But when we're pursuing peace, when we're pursuing unity, when we're striving to live in peace, then God's love and peace will be evident in our midst. Let me tell you, I want that. And to to God's honor, we've experienced that to a great degree here. But you know what? We're going to have to work hard to maintain the unity we have. It doesn't just continue automatically because we know it's there. Because we've talked about it. And then we come to the natural next part. And this is the verse that as a child we always snickered about. And as a mature adult I probably still snicker about. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, don't worry. You don't have to kiss everybody when you arrive next week. That's not what this is about, right? That, you know, but we've all seen this on TV, and it's, it's reflective in, in their culture. It was different. We, I think we kind of understand that, the whole thing, you know, where you kind of touch cheeks and kind of go, as you kind of touch someone's cheek or whatever. Because it was a cultural thing for them. And the reason it says holy kiss was because to make sure that there was nothing immoral or impure or sexual or, or romantic about it. This, was, this is not what that's about. This is just a, a, an issue of appropriate affection. Reminding us that we should be appropriately affectionate toward one another. Which points to the, to the fellowship and the joyful, intimate relationships we have with one another. Even though we have very different backgrounds. We have very different perspectives on some things. We have radically different demographics. And in fact, in our church, we have people that live in four different states. You know, Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, even people from California and Texas. And if a person from Texas can get along with people from Oklahoma, then that's got to be the work of God, right? If you grew up in either one, you know, right? (laughs) So we had all sorts of Oklahoma jokes growing up in Texas. I'll tell them later. I probably won't tell them. Some of them aren't appropriate. So (laughs) be that as it may. But this holy kiss listed here is, is the physical manifestation of a deep affectionate love that we're to have one another. Probably, realistically, in our culture, a hug is most representative of what they're saying. Not that you have to hug everyone when they come in next week. But it, and it's going to look a little bit different with different people. But, but physical, it's saying that there should be more than just this, I know you, I like you, I have an emotional connection with you, I have a spiritual connection with you. Well, there's a physical aspect to that too. A f- appropriate affection is the best way to put it. I don't know how else to kind of describe that because our relationship isn't merely mental, emotional, spiritual. 
just like parents need to be appropriately physically affectionate to their children, we should be appropriately physically affectionate to one another. And again, it's going to look different with different people at different times. But again, this if somebody were to just stand back in the back who was not part of us and just watch us all Sunday morning, I would hope they would say, man, those people love one another. That, that, that's what we want. We want that to be on display, our love for one another. And then there's this beautiful benediction. Paul is so good with benediction. And, and, and this might be the best benediction in, in, in all of the New Testament, maybe well, maybe the whole Bible. It's, just, it's, it's beautiful. It's Trinitarian. It closes the entire Corinthian saga. It, it, this is really reflective of what we do each week at the end of our service when, when, when we solemnly invoke a blessing on, on people as, as they depart. It's certainly rich and theologically dense. It's Trinitarian, reminding us again of the importance of the Trinity. Again, if anybody ever tries to tell you that the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity, say, well, look at 2 you know, Corinthians, the very last verse in 2 Corinthians. God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit. It's clearly there. And the three blessings that come in salvation, the blessings of grace and love and fellowship are all there. And if you, again, if you don't affirm the Trinity, you're not a Christian. This isn't a sermon on the Trinity, but it is right here in one verse. The Bible teaches that there is only one God and it calls... Three persons, God. So those three persons are the one God. And it's, it's beautiful. It's redemptive too, right? The love of God is first, reminding us that God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world and that He saved us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ highlights Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross for you and for me. And the result of that is that we're brought into the fellowship of the Holy Spirit as He indwells each one of us. He brings us into fellowship with Himself and He brings us into fellowship with one another. It's a perfect conclusion right here at the end of all this, especially flowing out of the, the unity and out of the affection that we should have. And then we come in and talk about the Lord and His triunity and what that does for us. Man, 1 Corinthians was really a, a pretty strong rebuke. 2 Corinthians comes in as a pretty powerful warning. But we can hear this. We can learn from this. And we can experience sanctification as we pursue what we find in here. And we can come to know the full riches that God grants us through redemption as we pursue sanctification. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, this, for, for these letters that lay out with so much clarity not only what we're not to be and, and, and not only the correction that it brings, but we thank you for, for what it teaches us in place of the things that we are to push out. Help us to focus on you. Help us to follow you more than anything else. Give us a deep desire to pursue sanctification and to strive toward holiness. And let our witness before the world be a beautiful picture of unity and love. Let us be, have in all that we do a demonstration of what it looks like to be faithful followers of you, loving you and loving one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.